good to see everyone here today. Uh, you may notice my voice is a little strange. Uh, I've been getting over being sick, and many of you inquired about that, and uh, were praying for me on Wednesday. I appreciate that. Uh, we'll make it through one way or another. <clears throat> We've been looking over the last uh, several months now at relationships that we find in the Bible, and as they're described to us through different metaphors or analogies that God uh, provides in Scripture for us. And we spent all of our time so far looking at the relationship that we have with God. And we've looked at that through several lenses. We looked at the idea uh, that we are God's servants, and that is that we are uh, to do what he requires us to do. We do his bidding, uh, and that, that is our main concern. We then focused that in on a particular type of servant and talked about stewardship and how that's such a good analogy for humanity in that we have been entrusted with certain things by God, and one day there will be an account that we give of how we've used those things that God has blessed us with and left in our charge. We then turned to a more personal relationship, and that was that of sons, and that focused on that love that God has for us, and what a blessing it is that God has chosen us to be his sons, and as sons, also his heirs. And then we turned to some of these uh, more strange metaphors, perhaps, and that they're not people, and that is that we are the temple or the house of God, and we're that both collectively as the church and individually as Christians, and in that is the case. Uh, it's important for us because God dwells in us, and so how we treat his temple is an important idea. And then we got even more specific and looked at the vessels in the temple, uh, and there's a metaphor about how we are vessels of God, specifically earthen vessels in one case, uh, which demonstrates the power and the glory that God has put into us, and then honorable vessels we spent some time looking at. Uh, where we find that we can choose to be vessels of honor because in a great house there are vessels of honor and vessels of dishonor. And so we should be focusing on being vessels that are useful for the master. And now we're going to leave that idea, that, that relationship we have with God. There's many other we could look at, but we must press on. And we're going to look at the idea or the relationship that we have with Jesus. And there are many metaphors we'll discover that talk about how we relate to Jesus. And we're going to begin with one that's probably the best uh, or most well-known, I would suspect, and that is of the shepherd uh, to the sheep. And so we're going to spend a couple of weeks looking at the idea of the relationship of shepherd and sheep and how we fill into that role. Well, we have the reading for us just a minute ago from Luke, the 15th chapter, and I would encourage you to open it up. We're going to spend all of our time uh, there in Luke 15 today in those first seven verses where Jesus tells this parable of the sheep. And as we look at that idea, there's some things that we want to notice about that relationship. But before we can do that, we need to look at those first two verses again and discover the reason that Jesus is telling this parable in the first place. In verses 1 and 2, there it says, Now the tax collectors and the sinners were all drawing near to hear him, and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners, and he eats with them. When Jesus tells this particular story, the reason for the parable is because he has surrounded himself with sinners, with people that the religious elite of the day looked at and said, these people are beneath you. If you were a scribe or a Pharisee or a prophet or a rabbi, you wouldn't have any dealings with these kinds of people. Now, the kinds of people they're talking about are not just the average everyday people on the street. Right? You might think of it that there's scribes and Pharisees, these, these religious elite that view themselves as we are dedicated wholly to the word of God. Then there would be this next class of people, which is just the people. The people who were Jews and were probably good Jews and followed the law of Moses, but who really, it wasn't their profession to be uh, at the temple every day or studying the law. But they did the things that the law required. And then there was this group of people that were beneath that in the eyes of the Jewish people. Those people who were just either openly sinful, they say these sinners, people who their sin was well known, or they were these people who were the publicans, people who they had thought had sold out to the enemy, the Roman occupiers. And so these were beneath uh, the rest of the class of Jews. And these people were coming to Jesus, and Jesus was teaching them and talking with them. And so he tells this story to them. And so in this story, we have to understand that the message here is that the sheep are the sinners. That's what's going on. Sheep equal sinners. That's what they are. And so when we look at this idea and that we're going to be compared with sheep over the next several weeks in several different passages, we need to keep that in mind. We are sheep. In this story, you do not want to be 
the scribes or the Pharisees, those that are grumbling against Jesus. You want to be a sheep, even though that makes you a sinner, because that's what we are. Don't ever forget that. That is what we are. And the next thing I want you to notice is that Jesus could have picked anything to compare them to. He could have picked any animal he wanted to compare them to, but he chose sheep. Now, my guess is, I didn't do a poll beforehand, but my guess is if I had gone around and asked all of the people that are under the age of uh, 13, let's just pick a, a letter there, a number. Let's pick a value there under the age of 13 and say, what animal, if you could be any animal, what animal would you most like to be? My guess is that I would have gotten zero sheep. That's just my guess. I would have gotten zero sheep. I probably could have asked all 60 some odd people in here, what animal would you most like to be? And might have gotten one or two sheep only because people might have been thinking of this already. But if it was just out on the street, they wouldn't have said it there. I would have probably still gotten zero sheep. Why is that? Why is that that no one would say, I want to be a sheep? Because sheep are boring. Sheep are stupid. Sheep are dirty. Sheep are weak. They're not fearsome animals. They're sheep. I didn't do the analysis, but my guess is none are coming to mind of any pro sports teams that are named after sheep. I don't think there's any college teams that call themselves the sheep. Maybe a ram, but sheep. No one wants to be a sheep. It's a humbling comparison that Jesus has chosen to make here. You're a sheep. You're not an eagle. You're not a bear. You're not a lion. You're a sheep. And Jesus picks that metaphor purposefully to demonstrate some characteristics about us. But enough about that. We'll spend time talking about that later. Because this story that he just tells here isn't really about the sheep at all. This is a story about a shepherd. And so as we look at this next several verses here, Jesus is laying out a story of a shepherd. And that makes sense. Because when the Pharisees come complaining, who are they complaining about? They're not really complaining about the sheep. They're complaining about Jesus spending time with the sheep. And so this is a story about Jesus' side of the metaphor here, that of the shepherd. So let's look and see what is the shepherd like towards us. <clears throat> As we look at that then, the first couple of verses in this story, he says, he spoke this parable to them, saying, which man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety and nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? Now, this is a very simple thing that he tells. It's a story that must clearly be familiar. I don't know anything about sheep, and you probably don't know that much about sheep. And the shepherding that we have today is probably not very much like this particular shepherding that we have here. But what he tells is clearly something they would all say, all of us would. This is what they all would have responded to this. It's a common idea that they would have. And so this seems like what a good shepherd would do. No one gets on Jesus' case and says, no shepherd does that. The metaphor he gives is appropriate and is valuable to the people of that day. He's telling us what a good shepherd is like. And the first characteristic we see of this particular shepherd is that the shepherd sees. That's what he does. The first thing the shepherd does is he sees. He notices the missing sheep. That's what he notices. Now, I, I took a quick count, and I think there's about 62 people in here today. And if one person wasn't in here, they got up and they left, would you even notice they were missing? Probably not. That's not even a hundred, right? If you had a hundred sheep, I mean, because at least this way I can tell, oh, you all look different to me. But if you put a hundred sheep out there and one of those sheep wanders off, are you going to notice that that sheep is missing? Probably not. Probably not. But the good shepherd sees. He looks out and he notices that one of my sheep is not here. He's gone missing. And so that's something that's important. Now, when he looks out and he sees that the one sheep is gone, don't think that that means that he's forgotten or doesn't know about the 99 that are also there. He knows about them. 
He understands their situation. He knows where they are. In fact, it says that he leaves them there in the open country, or I believe uh, the one that uh, Patrick, the one that Brandon was reading for us said that he leaves them there in the open pasture. The idea here is he leaves those sheep in a safe place, in their proper location, the place that they belong. There's not danger to those sheep there, and the shepherd knows that. He knows the 99 are safe, and he knows and he sees, he notices that the one is in danger. Now, there may be people here today that live their life in a way that feels like no one ever notices me. No one ever notices me. Now, I can't say that because you all notice me. You see me up here talking to you. It's impossible for you not to notice me. But you may be out there saying, you know what, I can sometimes go and all of be at services and be there and things are good, but I wonder if I wasn't there if anyone would notice that I was missing that day. Or maybe you would say, I don't feel that way in my religious family here, my church family, because we do a good job of that. But you know, I go throughout my day at my job all the time, and no one ever comes by and notices me. I don't have a job that people say, oh, good job, and appreciate what I do. I feel like no one notices me. But if you're one of Jesus' sheep, you don't have to worry about that. Because Jesus sees. Jesus notices you. The next thing that the shepherd does there that was also found in those verses was the shepherd then goes out and he searches. The good shepherd sees, and the good shepherd, he goes and he searches. Now, why does he search? Well, the simple answer is because the sheep is lost. That's why he goes and searches. I was sitting and I was thinking about different way. They have posted up things that says, like, there's a lost animal there. You know what I'm talking about? And most of the time, that's a lost dog. Right? Lost dog, reward, and people are out there looking for their dog. And I've seen people come by my house before when we're sitting outside during the day or during the evening. And they'll come by and say, hey, have you seen a dog run by here? Uh, no, I haven't seen a dog run by here. You know what I've never seen? I've never seen someone come along and say, hey, have you seen my cat come running by here? Very rarely do I see posters up that says, lost cat. People don't go searching for cats. You know why people don't go searching for cats? Because they don't get lost. They come and they go and they know where their place is and they're always coming back again. People don't go searching for animals that aren't lost. But if you were a shepherd and your sheep wanders off, you're not going to be thinking, you know what, I'll just put all the other sheep away and go home. I'm sure the other sheep will come back at some point whenever he's ready. Because that's not what sheep do. They get lost. They wander off and they can't find their way back. And so Jesus goes and he searches for the sheep because a good shepherd searches for that which is lost. And understand something. The shepherd leaves everything to go find the sheep. Jesus left everything to come find us when we were lost. He left it all. We have lots of songs that talk about all of the great and amazing things that Jesus left to come here to save us. Not only did Jesus leave everything to save us, but he sacrificed everything to save us. It was a big sacrifice that Jesus makes all the way to his life to save us, to find us. And this shepherd is doing the same thing. The shepherd in the story, while we don't hear about it, that song we sang paints a good picture. The shepherd has hardship to find the sheep. The shepherd goes out into the wild and the dangers himself to track down that which is lost. That is what the shepherd does. He searches. And Jesus is still concerned for the lost sheep today. If you're out there today and you have not come to know Jesus, Jesus is still searching for you. He's concerned about you. Because the good shepherd He searches. Let's look at verse 5. Verse 5 says, And when he has found it, that is the sheep, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. We've seen that the good shepherd, he sees that the sheep is missing. He goes out and he searches for that sheep. And the shepherd also saves the sheep. That's what the shepherd does. The shepherd saves. We can see here in this story that this shepherd is actively caring for the sheep. 
That's clear by the fact that he notices that one sheep out of the hundred is missing, that he's actively caring for all of the sheep. But beyond that, when he goes out and he notices the sheep is gone and he presses off into the wilderness to find that sheep, when he finds it, what does he do? He takes that sheep and he puts it on his shoulders and he carries it home. Now, I want you to think about this. You ever lost your dog? I have. And we've gone out and we've found the dog. And when I find the dog, you know what I do with the dog? I probably have a leash or collar and I put it on it and I walk him home. Or maybe he's gotten really far and I've driven my truck. I say, jump in the truck and I close the door and I take him home. Not once have I picked up my dog and put him on my shoulders and carried him home. Never. I don't do that. When Jesus goes out and he finds the lost sheep here, he doesn't take the sheep and say, come along and walk in front of it. He doesn't go and take the sheep and pull a rope around its neck and drag it home. He goes out and he picks up the sheep and he puts it on his shoulders. Now, again, I'm not sure how far the shepherd has wandered around looking for this sheep, but my guess is it's not close. The reason my guess is it's not close is because he says that he's left the 99 in the pasture where they belong and he walks out searching. He's left there. He's gone somewhere far enough away that he can't see the other 99 sheep anymore. He's a ways out. Let's call it a mile. Let's call it two miles away from the other sheep. He goes and he finds the sheep and he picks it up and he throws it over his shoulder and he carries it home. Now, I know some of you probably complain when you have to walk out to your car and get a five-pound sack of flour and carry it in the house. You ever see those strongest man competitions I'm talking about? They were real popular in the late 90s and the early 2000s, I guess. You don't see them as much anymore, but they still have them. You watch on ESPN, they have the strongest man competition. And they would do ridiculous things, like take these full, you know, 100-pound eggs and throw them up over a wall behind them that's 10 feet tall. They would pick up, uh, hold two cars, one in each hand on, on a slope, and see how long you can hold it before the cars fall away. Or one of the things they would do is they would take some large, heavy thing, large stones uh, or rocks or things in the shape of a, the, whatever state they were in, a giant puzzle piece of a map kind of a thing, and you'd hold it in your hand or an anchor, and they'd just carry it for as long as they can. And you'd walk, and you'd turn and walk back, you turn and walk, and you turn and walk back. And whoever got the farthest before you just drop it wins. Right? It's heavy. Carry things. I want you to go home tonight, and I want you to find the heaviest thing that you've got that you can comfortably pick up and carry. And I want you to put it on your shoulder. I want you to go for a walk around the block. I want you to see, like, yeah, that was a good, fun experience for me. That's what the shepherd does. He comes, he finds the sheep, and instead of kicking it, saying, you stupid sheep, why'd you wander off? He picks it up, he puts it on his neck, and he carries it home. Because the shepherd saves. That's what the shepherd does. It reminds me of that verse you see in Ephesians uh, chapter 2, and verse 8, there where it says that you are saved by grace through faith, and even that is not of yourself, it's the gift of God. God has given us this. Jesus has come and saved us of his own gift, because the shepherd saves. Let's look at verses 6 and 7. It says there, And when he comes home, he calls together all of his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. The last thing we see about the shepherd is that the shepherd sees, the shepherd searches, the shepherd saves, and then the shepherd, he celebrates. It doesn't start with an S, but it sounds like it does. The shepherd, the shepherd celebrates. Jesus takes joy in saving his sheep. He takes joy. Now, you might think, oh, that might be a pretty normal thing for people to do. I don't think it was. I think that was a strange thing to do, to call all the friends and neighbors together and throw a party because you found the lost sheep. And the reason I think that's the case is because, again, on every occasion where I've had to go out and find a lost animal, never once have I gone to all of my friends and neighbors and said, come, rejoice with me. My dog that was lost has been found. Never once have I done that, and never have I been invited to somebody's house for that purpose. You don't rejoice over lost animals. 
You just really don't. But this shepherd goes out, finds it, comes home, calls together all of his friends, and celebrates. And the reason that is, is because Jesus takes joy in saving sheep. He loves it. It's what he loves to do. If you've been saved, I want you to think back, and I want you to realize, remember, there was joy the day that you were found. There was joy the day that you were found, that God found you, that Jesus saved you. There was joy in heaven. If you're still out there and you've not been found by Jesus, there is joy waiting. It's just waiting. It's like, imagine a surprise party kind of a thing, right? You know, a surprise party, it's all set up and everyone's there. Everyone's just waiting for the person to come home so the party can start. That's what it's like in heaven right now. Up there, the angels are waiting. The party is set. They're ready to rejoice, and they're just waiting for you to come home. Jesus takes joy in his sheep. I want you to think about that as well. It's an interesting statement that he says there. It says that likewise, there'll be more joy over one that repents than over the 99 that needed no repentance. Now, understand this. Jesus takes joy in all of his sheep. That's what the shepherd does. It doesn't say that the shepherd was happy only because he found this sheep and he was really miserable before. No, he took joy in the 90 and 9 that he had also, but he takes more joy in finding another one because the shepherd finds his joy in his sheep. That's what the good shepherd does. He celebrates. Let's go to God in prayer. Our God and our Father, we come to you and we thank you for this opportunity we've had to open up your word and to study uh, what you've left for us here through your wisdom and your providence and your protection of, of carrying this down through the ages. Uh, we thank you for providing us this uh, relationship that we have with your son uh, and the way that you've described it for us with shepherd and sheep. And we're so thankful that Jesus has demonstrated what a great shepherd that he is. Uh, we're thankful that he sees and that he notices each and every one of us. We're thankful that he left all to search for us and find us and the sacrifices he made to do that. We're thankful that Jesus saves, that he goes uh, to great lengths to bring us back to himself and that he did all of those things for us uh, so that we could have this free gift from you. And we're thankful that he celebrates us, that he's so joyous over our lives and we do good things, that he's so grateful uh, and happy when, when one lost sinner is saved. And Father, we pray that you'd help us to have that same joy uh, in his sheep and in finding uh, lost souls for him. We thank you, Father, for this avenue of prayer we have through you or to you through him and we are grateful that we are able to come before you and bring our petitions and, and praise your great and holy name. It's in Jesus name we pray. Amen.